Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm an alcoholic, and I go by Logan. Hey, Logan. Hey, Logan. Um, and I say that because that is a large part of my story. Um, I know that, uh, you know, I was thinking about it. I, I didn't think a lot about um, speaking because when I do, my mind races, and I want to make it sound big and grand and beautiful. And everybody like me, right, and think that I'm awesome and all that, you know, my ego and my pride, uh, all based in self. Um, and it was suggested to me to um, ask my higher power to give me the words to share the message of hope, that there is a solution, right? Um, so hopefully I do that this evening. Um, let's see. I am to tell in a general way what it used to be like, what happened, and what it's like now. Right? I was born and raised here in Atlanta, Georgia. Born and raised in Sandy Springs down off Peachtree Domini Road by the YMCA soccer fields. If anybody is from here or familiar with that area. Nay. All right. No Georgians. Cool. Um, and growing up, I had um, I had a very good childhood. I had a very privileged childhood. I went to a uh, private school that was one of the two top private schools in Atlanta. Um, I could have I had anything and everything that a child could ask for. Right. I had loving parents, um, big family, material things out the wazoo. Uh, but I never felt as if I was right. I always felt odd, different, out of place, whether it would be with my family or in school or anywhere else. Um, I come from a family of alcoholics. My father, my brother, my uncle, and my grandpa, who died from the disease directly. Um, And going through all that, I never thought that I was going to have an issue with it, right? Never even crossed my mind. So at the age of 14, uh, when I had my first drink, and I experienced the sensation from that drink, I chased that for the rest of my life until I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, so, I brought the big book just in case I was going to read something out of it, but I don't know if that's going to happen, so we'll see what happens. Um, it's really interesting being back in Sandy Springs. I don't get down here often because I moved up to uh, Canton about seven, eight years ago, uh, which is the best thing I've done in a long time besides get sober, which I didn't get sober, and my higher power helped me get sober. but. It's interesting to come back and see, like, I'm reminiscing and thinking of all the things that I did here in this area, you know, and a lot of it all revolved around drinking, you know, if not all of it revolved around drinking. Um, All right, so that being said, um, born and raised here, uh, went to um, a good private school, and it had a religious foundation, and it was a very... uh, a very elite school, right? And it was all based on mon- monetary value is where you were on the social ladder, right? So therefore, um, it was very strict in that fact, right? And, if, and at one point at, um, I believe it was sixth grade, uh, some kids in the class were having a conversation about um, the Bible and Jesus and God and all that. And I looked over to them and I said, well, I don't know if I believe in Jesus. And from that point forward, <laughs> right? that point forward, um, nobody in that school talked to me. Nobody. Absolutely not. They shunned me. They made fun of me, ridiculed me, which just added to the feelings, you know, that I'd already had, you know, growing up to that point. Uh, and I don't say that to say that that's what caused my alcoholism. It that just elevated the emotions and the feelings that I had inside, right? And I'd always look for ways to escape, right? Because I never wanted to be me. And then I found comic books, right? And my name is not Logan. My birth name is Jonathan Charles. Right? Only my mother calls me Jonathan, so don't try it over at the Wednesday meeting. Right? Um, because I found comic books, and it was a world in which I could escape. I could escape the reality of the fear and the pain that I was feeling uh, on a day-to-day basis. You know, uh, And coming to find Wolverine to be my favorite comic book character. Right? See, I mean, he's the old cannibal head. Right? He's, he's tough. He doesn't back down from anything. He's loyal. He's strong. He's diligent, you know, and he's fearless. All the things that I wanted to be and thought that I was, but I wasn't, right? Um, so I donned the name Logan, um, and I went with it from there. And I had spent my life 
in that fantasy world trying to be that way, but never really being that way. Um, I always wanted to fit in, but I didn't know how to fit in or where to fit in. I remember in Lenox Mall, I was probably eight or nine, still young enough to where I had to hold my mother's hand, right? We're walking through Lenox Mall, and I see this guy walking towards us, and he's decked out in leather, combat boots, big old mohawk chains and spikes, and I was in awe. Like, I want to be like that. And, you know, that's, and that's what I did after that point. Um, and now that I can't grow a mohawk up here, I just grow it down here on my face, you know? <laughs> I was sad, actually. I cried and got drunk when I had to shave my mohawk off. I was terribly upset because that last pin was just too thin right there, and, you know? It just didn't look right. So, um, so needless to say, um, living in that for lack of a better term, lifestyle, uh, the punk rock lifestyle, it was all chaos, anarchy, and disorder, and that was fun for me. Like, I enjoyed doing that, breaking things, tearing things up, burning things, trashing it, you know. Um, and I met people who did the same thing, so, you know, we ran together, and we ran together for a long time. And, you know, when I started feeling, I know that the first time when I got drunk at 14, and I will bounce back and forth because it's what I do, um, there was a Chastain Park. I was 14 years old. My parents told my brother, my older brother, to take me with him. So he did, begrudgingly. And when we get there, he gives me a four-pack of Bartles and James, right? And he said, be back by this time. Now get out, right? And I was like, all right, cool. And I drank those four. And then I went around to all the little different groups, and I was drinking and doing other things. And I would had that feeling of belonging, being okay, and I was cool, and I was accepted. I'm sure in hindsight, they were having a good time getting the 14 year old messed up and making fun of him. I'm sure. But at that point I felt like I was there and I was cool and everything was all right, man. And I did for the remainder of my time out there. I did chase that every time that I drank. I didn't, I don't drink to socialize. I don't drink to unwind. I drink to get drunk. That's the only way that I drink. That's the only way I know how to drink. You know, the times in my life where I had to a threat of death by wife or parents not get drunk at a function, I was miserable and I was angry and I was pissed off and I couldn't wait to get out of there so I could go drink like I wanted to, right? But this whole time, I never thought that I had a problem with alcohol, right? So I've been married twice, divorced twice. Um, and I could spend a lot of time talking about all the things that I did do. I've been arrested a lot of times. I've had two DUIs only two DUIs, and I should have countless DUIs, because um, I used to think my motorcycle had autopilot, right? You see, if I could get in, look in the driveway and it was standing up, everything was fine. See, it gets me home. It's not a problem. Um, so, and all that happening, um, you know, I started running away. Uh, I started doing um, other things, outside issues, uh, but I used to I always say things like when people, friends of mine were doing um, other other things, I would say, look, man, I'm not doing heroin, crack, cocaine, meth. I'm just drinking, so leave me alone. It's okay. It's not that bad, right? I'm just drinking. Um, and it made absolute sense to me, complete and utter sense to me, right? And it was justifiable because um, I can justify anything to get what I want. So got married first time. Um, finally got divorced because... I slept with a best friend. She didn't like that, so she left me. Um, got married again later, and in that marriage, it was I met her at the Royal Oak Pub. She was a bartender slash server, and that was my bar that I went to. My first wife and I, when we got divorced, I said, okay, you can have Alpharetta and the other places that we used to go. Just leave me the pub. That's mine, right? And so that was my pub. That was one place that I went. Um, and so I met my second wife there, and it was all very casual, very laid back until she comes up to me and says, I'm pregnant. I'm like, okay, cool. All right, you're pregnant. And uh, went along with that. And come to find out that my daughter is not mine biologically. Uh, and we found that out before she was born. And I can say that at that point, I had every reason to walk away. I had every right to walk away because I had no tie whatsoever. I can see it more clearly now that I couldn't see it then, but I couldn't walk away. You know, that's a prime example to me of a, of a power greater than myself doing something for me that I couldn't do for myself, you know, because now I have a daughter, right? Uh, and then later on, I have a son, you know, great gifts that I've been given, you know, um, that I never thought were a gift. 
I spent my professional career in culinary, which worked exceedingly well with drinking and other things, right? Because you go in, you work 14, 15 hours a day, close down the kitchen, drinking and other things while you're doing that, and then go close down a bar, pass out for a couple hours and crawl back in and do it again. I did that for 20-something years, six to seven days a week. And it just, yeah, like it says in the big book, you know, the alcoholic life is the only normal life. That to me was absolutely and completely normal. Like there was nothing wrong with that. We used to, it, to me, it was a, it was a matter of pride to walk in with a hangover and rock through it one more time. You know, it's just the way it was. So, um, anyways, so my second wife and I, uh, we decide to, I've come to realize that it was ego and selfishness on my part because she was 16 years younger than me. And at that point, before she said, you know, I'm pregnant, I was thinking, well, see, I'm, I'm a pimp, man. I got this beautiful young woman who wants to be with me, so life can't be that bad, right? If I could rationalize and justify that I've got this person or that thing, well, life's not that bad, and I don't have to look at the problem. I don't have to look at the issue, right? Um, so I decided to ask her to marry me, um, and she did. Um I know that in my first marriage, my wife and I both played a part. In my second marriage, my second wife, she didn't play a part. She did everything like it says in the big book, you know, talking about how, you know, the good wife that goes through it all and is there for you and tries to get. She did all that, man. She was beautiful, awesome, and loving, right? And I was just an alcoholic, you know, selfish and self-centered to the extreme, all rooted in fear. Um, and she was the first one to me ever in my life to say maybe you drink too much like with all the alcoholism in my family nobody ever said that to me right uh with all the people that i ran with nobody ever said that to me but she my first wife never said that to me right she was the first one to say that and i was like well i don't think so why she's like well because you don't seem to be able to control it i don't know what you mean but okay so what do you want me to do She's like, well, can you try just not drinking as much? I'm like, okay, I'll try. And I was saying to myself, sure, no problem. You know, that ego, like, yeah, no problem, baby. I got it. Don't worry about it. Um, and I would try. <laughs> and then I would realize that uh, I started to realize that I couldn't control it. Like when I would, uh, when I would um, have a beer because when I got to work, I was getting over the hangover by 12 o'clock. I started to think about drinking. By 3 o'clock, I was ready to get the hell out of there so I could go drink. And then by 5 o'clock, I was going as fast as I could in traffic to be able to get to the store to get the beer to get back to the house so I could drink. But again, that's rational, right? That's just everyday living, you know? Um, And it progressed to where I would continue to try to do it, but I would work it to where I would get a 24-ounce at the store, drink it on the drive to the house, so when I got to the house and opened the door with a six-pack of tall boys, which is not six, it's eight, right? Because you have to do the math and understand, right? Because I still also have four out back, two on the porch, three in the fridge, right? But no, baby, I only got a six-pack. It's cool. And I crack it as I go on the door, take a sip, then go give her a kiss so she'll smell the alcohol because I just took the sip. I can see that now being more sober, right, being in the program. But then it just it made sense and it seemed right and normal, like I wasn't hiding anything. I didn't think I was hiding anything, you know. Um, and then there would be times I'd say I'd go, you know, one day I would have one beer, one day I wouldn't have a beer. And all the while, I would come home with a six-pack every night, regardless if I drank one or drank none. So by Friday, I could drink the way I really wanted to, Right. But needless to say, nothing changed. And I eventually went back to my old habits and my old ways because for me, those foxhole prayers that people talk about, I would always do those when I got a DUI or my first wife left or I got, you know, beaten up by the cops. It was just get me out of this. Let me just calm down a little bit and then I can go back to the way I wanted to live my life. Right. Everything would be okay. Well, I continued that and she went to her family's on a trip with the kids and never came back. So on the day she was supposed to come back, she never came back. I text her, call her, she never answered. So three days later, she finally texts me and says, I'm not coming home. I'm like, oh, okay, I must have really screwed up. Um, I say all that because with my history and my family of alcoholics and AA um, 
and all the things that have happened in my life, divorce, DUIs, um, getting beaten up and arrested by cops, uh, it all centered around drinking, but I never thought it was a problem, and AA had never crossed my mind. I used to hang out at the Waffle House right up there. That used to be right up there, right? We would meet there, figure out where we're going to go, and then go do it, meet back up, figure out where the next place is to go, and then go do it, and then go back to the Waffle House, right? That was just the central point. Like, it's crazy to see what's over there now. The Waffle House, the Mellow Mushroom, and the uh, Tattoo Parlor's not there anymore, you know. Anyways, things change, right? Um, I lost my train of thought. Where was I? Besides the place that I need to be, which is an AA meeting around my fellows, right? Because if there's, like, I was thinking about it. Like, when I was coming up here, I was like, I'm going to be nervous. I'm going to be, I'm going to be, uh, like, oh, my God, I'm gonna, all these people that I don't know. I mean, I don't know Jerry, but I don't know who else I'll know and who will be here. And then I started thinking, I was like, well, I'm going to be around a bunch of drunks. So I'm cool, man. It doesn't matter. You know, like, we're all the same. And we're all in this together, you know. And that wasn't the case for me in the beginning, man. You guys were freaks, weirdos, God, holding hands, all that crap. No way. Absolutely not. Okay, I remember where I was. Um, <laughs> see, you just go off kilter one way and it brings you back around that way. So it works out. So, um, but I had never thought about AA. Like, we used to party and people would come up to us and be like, I need to ride to 8111. We'd stop what we were doing, go drop them off at the clubhouse, and then come back and drink, you know? And I was just that place that you took those people, right? I'm like, yeah. Um, but when she didn't come back, I went to an AA meeting. It had never crossed my mind in, in, in my life before at all, you know? And I don't know why I did then. I do believe I know why now, again, a power greater than myself. Um, and I walked in, but I had the full intention of just getting my wife and kids back. I had no intentions on stopping drinking, never thought that I had a problem. I was just playing the game one more time. But as she continued not to come back, I continued to go to AA because I didn't know what else to do, right? And I was still drinking, absolutely still drinking. But I wanted to be able to prove that I was doing the, going to the meetings, trying to get help, so she would finally come around to say, oh, okay, you're trying, I'll come back, right? Thankfully, she didn't. Um, I can honestly say if she did, I don't, I don't believe I would be here today, honestly. Um, I think the best thing that she could have done for herself, our children, and me is to not come back. And I'm grateful for that. Um, I sure wasn't that way in the beginning. I was angry um, and scared, terribly scared, you know, because I had messed up once again. I have destroyed my life once again. Um, and I've come to realize in the program that everything, that I do is centered around fear, selfishness and self-centered, hundred forms of fear. Absolutely. Fear of not getting what I want, losing what I have, um, what you will think of me, what you won't think of me, um, fear of what might happen, what might not happen, all that. Um, it's all fear. If there is one thing that I can truly say that this program has given me, it's given me the realization to know that I do not have to be afraid today. I have a choice today to not be afraid. It's not always easy because it's secondary for me to be afraid, but I have the ability to work on it, right? And I'm very grateful for that. So she didn't come back. I kept going to AA, and I would, and my head was down. I never looked at anybody. Um, Y'all asked me not to cuss, so I won't tell you what I used to tell everybody. And that was it. Was the only thing I ever told them. You can ask anybody in my home group, and they'll tell you what I told them. Um, but I kept going because I didn't know what else to do. And um, as I stayed in the meetings, I started to hear little things, just tiny little tidbits. Maybe it was a word or maybe it was a phrase or maybe it was the sound in somebody's voice. But I started to feel more comfortable being in a meeting about Alcoholics Anonymous where I'd come to realize that I've never been 100% comfortable anywhere in my life, ever. Like right now, I'm completely comfortable because I am in a place that I am absolutely 100% safe, right? And a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous should be safe for everyone that comes, no matter what, right? Because we're all the same and we all share in a common peril. Uh, so I started saying, I, you know, I'm not going to say I got one white chip. Um, I gave all mine back to my home group because um, I stopped counting. Um, <laughs> you know, and, they, and I like it. I don't personally like, and this is my opinion, I don't personally like hearing people 
glorifying relapse because to me relapse does not have to be a part of recovery it really doesn't you know um i was in a meeting today and they were talking about bottoms you know and the idea of bottoms and i rock bottom and where when do i stop and how do i stop and when do i know it's the rock bottom and i was told because i kept beating my head against the wall it's like your bottom is when you stop digging you know when you've had enough is enough when the pain and suffering is great enough you'll know you know Thankfully today, my last bottom I pray is my last bottom, but it is at least for today, right? And that's all we have is today, right? That's the only thing we're promised, and we're not even promised all of today. Anything can happen, so. <clears throat> Anyways, um, so I kept going, and I finally got to the point where the pain and suffering of drinking got me really into the rooms, the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I tried to not drink and I started taking suggestions and I started listening more and I started, I started to talk to people slightly, uh, ever so slightly. Um, and then the pain and suffering of me being me, the way I was got me willing to work the steps to the best of my ability, which I don't do all the time by any means. That's one of the things I like and how it works, which y'all don't read here, but what I like and how it works is that we are not saints. It's progress, not perfection, right? That, you know, we, we claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. And I'm grateful for that, you know, very grateful for that. Because if I had to be perfect, I wouldn't be here, you know. Um, there is one individual in the program that I had met when she came in. She and I sort of kind of dated, um, but we didn't. And thankfully, because of the program, and the program is the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and the principles behind the program, uh, we have been able to do something different, and that's remain friends after a situation like that. Because in my past, I wouldn't remain friends. They would, you would never want to talk to me again. You'd never want to see me. And if you did see me, you'd want to do very violent things to me, right? Um, she told me one day, she said, you know what, Logan, you're a wonderful human. And even saying it makes me choke up because for whatever reason that hit me in such a way, that it let me know that everything is okay, right? That I am human, I am fallible, so therefore I will make mistakes and that everything will be all right as long as I'm willing to try to do things differently to the best of my ability, right? And that helps a lot for me to know that as long as I remain honest, open, and willing, everything will be okay, right? It doesn't, I don't have to have the answers. I don't, I don't have to make it all right and perfect. It doesn't all have to look good. But as long as I remain honest, open, and willing, It'll, it'll be okay. And I'm grateful for that. So her saying that, and it still means the world to me because I've been told you're, I'm a good guy. You know, you're a good guy, man. Uh, you're all right, dude. We like you. You know, it never meant anything, but say that you're a wonderful human. I don't know. Maybe it was just for my ears, but for me, it meant the world to me. And it still does today. Um, so I started working the steps and my sponsor, uh, on step one <laughs> asked me to do an, uh, unmanageability list. Um, and that for me helped me see how, um, the beginning to see how my life revolved around drinking. Every aspect of my, my life revolved around getting drinking or getting alcohol, how much I'm going to drink, where I'm going to drink, with whom I'm going to drink, what I'm going to do, right? What's going to happen? Those delusions of grandeur in my mind. Um, and then that helped me get to step two because I balked at step three for the longest time. God to me was a four letter word. Is that an iPhone? All technology is intimidating to me. I don't think I've ever played with an iPhone. <laughs> not that I don't like your phone, whoever that is, but all right, I'm just not going to, I don't want to mess it up. Um, so um, for me, God was a four-letter word, um, and I didn't want to have anything to do with God. I'm grateful that this program is not a religious program. There is a difference between religion and spirituality. Religion is something that you have to do, right, based on things that other people say spirituality is something that you grow into i believe i grow into i shouldn't say you i say i um i can say we but not not you at least that's the way i was told you know keep it to me uh and us because again we do this together so and that being said i'm grateful that it's spiritual not religious um that helped me get closer to step two. And my, and my sponsor said to me, I was like, well, just like it says in the big book, when, when, uh, Evie was talking to Bill, uh, well, why don't you come up with your own conception of God? 
And you say, well, what is your conception of your higher power? You know, use, write down what you think your higher power is. Okay, so I did, and I wrote a lot of things, but the one thing that stood out to me and the one thing that remains above all the other things that I wrote, that is my, my higher power is love, right? Because I never thought that I was worthy of being loved, right? Ever. I don't know why I have an 830 alarm. Technology, see, it's not my fault, it's against me, man. <laughs> Um, I don't know what that is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that was weird. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's evil, man. Uh, huh? Oh, yeah. Okay. There you go. I've already went over. So there you go. Well, they'll just have to come in here. So, um, so step two and, uh, love because I, I, I've lived my life not feeling that I was worthy of being loved. Um, but I, yet I, mean, I my parents, my mother, I mean, that I was loved my whole life by all my family, right? But I never had that feeling. So that helped me to get to be willing to look at step three, the idea of God, right? Now, if I could say that if my conception of God, as I understand him, if that is love, right, then love is okay. Love is good. Love is warm. Love, love is safe. Love is comforting. So, okay. All right. But really, in the truest sense, each one of these steps, I had to get to the point where I just said, F it, right? F it, all right. I'm powerless. Yep, I'm unmanageable. Okay, F it, right? <laughs> something bigger than me can do it. F it, okay. And then something will. Okay, whatever. Let's just do it because I want to stop drinking, but I can't. I realized for the last two years of my drinking, I would wake up every morning and say, I'm not going to drink today. And by the end of the day, I was drinking every single day, right? Um, once I got past step three, then there was that fear of step four and fear of step five. I balked at that for a while. Um, and then somebody said to me, because I'd heard in the meetings all the time, you know, step four, it's hard, it's tough, you know? Um, and I was like, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm going with you, right? I'm like, yeah, it is. I'm not going to do it. Um, <laughs> and somebody said to me, you know, you're just writing down all the crap you have in your head that you carried with you your whole life, man. So just write it down and know that nobody has to see it, right? Saying it is another step, and you're currently on step four, so just do it. I'm like, oh, okay, fine, I can do that. I mean, that and that kind of that kind of stuff helped me. Like, okay, because I like the future trip. I like to be out there. I like to be back there. I like to be everywhere except here, right? So I did that. Uh, and then it came to step five, and my sponsor... Uh, at this point lived at the end of a road uh, on a ridge out in the woods. And it's a beautiful little place to go to, uh, but there's a lot of coyotes. And uh, <laughs> so I show, I, he said, where do you want to do your fist up? I was like, out there on the ridge line. And he's like, okay. And so I, I show up to his house. I get out of the car. I've got my fist up. I got my big book. And then I get my gun out, right, because there's a lot of coyotes. And my sponsor looks at me and says, this is just a fist step, man. <laughs> don't worry it's just for the coyotes man <laughs> but so and and we prayed before uh doing the fifth step asking god to give us the strength to be honest uh and open and willing um and we commenced to do the fifth step and i was terribly afraid internally that once all those things that i i could recall to memory were said forth to one individual because i had spent my life saying some things to certain people, but not everything to one person, right? Because it was easy and I could manage it that way. Um, I was afraid that he wasn't gonna, he wasn't gonna be able to look me in the eye anymore. He wasn't gonna smile at me. He wasn't wanting to give me a hug anymore and say, hey, what's up, buddy? Uh, I was terribly, terribly afraid of that. And upon doing the fifth step, um, at the end of it, while in the midst of it, he shared his experiences with me, telling me, some of the things that I had showing me that some of the things I had done, he had done, and then other things he had done even worse, you know? Uh, and at the end of it, you know, we stood up and he looked at me and he said, I love you. And he gave me a hug. I, to this day, still can't ex explain the feeling that I got from that, that sensation and the emotions, um, the closest thing I can say is empty, but not in a bad way, empty in a good way, like empty as in no more, no longer, no need, you know, and it was phenomenal. 
Um, and then he told me to go home, like it says in the big book, take an hour, sit down somewhere quiet, take down the book, look at the first five propositions, ask, and I'll paraphrase it because I'm not going to get it right, uh, you know, ask if we've uh, a solid foundation, mortar, enough sand, you know, and really think about it. And while I was doing that, some other things came up, right? Because you know, more will be revealed. And I'm like, man, I have already told him so much. Mm-hmm. Why do I have to do these? And I thought about it for a while, and then I called him at the end of the hour, and I said, man, I got more. And he's like, all right, I'll see you tomorrow. Because, uh, again, it was an effort for me. I was like, dude, I've gone this far. I can't stop now. There's no point, man. And the things that I had told him, same line. Not, you know, so I got to do it. And I did it. And it, again, felt good. It was something, one, two more things that I did not have to carry with me any longer. And that is such a great feeling. Um, Six step, at that point, doing the fifth step, seeing my defects of character and how my life was ruled by them, um, I had the willingness for them all to be removed. Absolutely. So the six step wasn't a problem for me. I really didn't want to, to, in my ego, I really didn't want to have them anymore. I wanted God to take them right then, right there, right? And I'm done and I'll be clean and I'll be great. And I was ready nonetheless. Uh, and so he said, okay, in two ways you can do the seven step. You can, uh, you can get down on your knees and recite the seven step prayer as it is. Or you can get down on your knees and recite the seven-step prayer for each one of your defects of character that have been brought forth in the fifth step. I was like, all right, I'll do the latter, right? So that way I could address each one of them. Um, and I did that. And then he suggested that I take and write down each one of them, put them on a uh, little slip of paper, and put it into a container. And then every morning I shake it up, and whatever jumps out is the one that I'm going to focus on. Not to say that I'm not focusing on the others, but that's the one I'm going to really look at. Um, to try to work on because I believe that, you know, my higher power is not just going to take them all from me, right? He's going to want me to put in some footwork too. I mean, this is a program of action, right? And I do believe, me personally, I believe all the steps are action steps. A lot of people say, you know, action is like four, five, and beyond, right? I believe they are. I had to take the action to to admit that I'm powerless over alcohol, right? I had to take the action to admit that I that a power greater than myself can restore me to action or to sanity, and that I have to uh, take the action to get the willingness to turn it over to that higher power. So, whether you agree with me or not, that's okay. For me, they're all action steps, absolutely. Um, and then the eighth step, you know, all those people um, that I had harmed in my life, uh, good, bad, and indifferent, um, to look at them all on paper. Uh, and there were a lot that I was willing to make amends to, and there was a couple that I wasn't willing to make amends to. Um, and my sponsor went through that with me to uh, help me see which ones to do when and how to do it, right? Um, and I have not made all of my amends. I haven't. Um, there are some that are difficult, and we're still working with those, trying to trying to pursue different things, um, because some people cannot be reached for whatever reason. You know, some are dead and some that I just, I can't recall, you know, specifically. But um, I still remain willing now today to make amends to all individuals on my list. When Jerry asked me to come down here and speak, um, I mistook this location for the one down there at the other end of Mount Vernon, right next to Riverwood High School. I hadn't thought about it in 30 years. I have to go make an amends to that church. Because 30 years ago, that was one of the only churches that left their doors open. I'd really be interested to see if they still have them open late at night because of us. But we used to go in there and drink and steal things and do other stuff right in that church. And I had totally forgotten about that and talked to my sponsor about it. And I have a plan of what to do to go in there to try to see about making amends. Um, But that proves to me what it says in the book. You know, more will be revealed and it it will be revealed. Um, Because... It was, what, two weeks ago when you asked me, or three weeks ago when you asked me, because it it came flooding back in. Um, You know, my wife, my first wife didn't come back, and or or my second wife didn't come back. My first wife I never thought I would see again. In the process of making amends, um, I ran across my first wife, and slowly we started to just communicate by text, because we had spent 18 years together. Right. Married for five, 18 together. 
Um, and I had the opportunity to make a men's tour, and it was it was wonderful and phenomenal for the fact that we both cried, like snot pouring, you know, terrible crying, slobbering, admitting. And now she texted me today talking about a old punk rock band wire that's playing up in Nashville where she's living and the fact that, it, uh, yeah, well, yeah, but it's $25 for a ticket, man. The old punk rock. Yeah. yeah. Well, subhumans came back in September. Right. And I wanted to go see him. That's the greatest punk rock band of all time. Subhumans. Um, and I had seen him when, back when the point was still here and I was living in, uh, down by Jacksonville. Um, so I've seen everything they played. I realized at that point, because people said, oh, I'll go with you, don't worry about it. And I had to come, I, I was able to come to the understanding that if I went to that show, I'd drink, right? Because I've never been to a show sober. And we go drink in the parking lot, we get wasted, we go inside, we get in the pit, we get into fights, we drink more, we have fun, you know, we get thrown out or arrested. That's just what we do. So I made the decision that I don't need to go. It's okay. Like, I'm okay saying no today, um, which is not something that I was comfortable with. I would never say no and say, okay, let's go do it, right? Because when I drink, everything's a great idea. So usually when people ask me things, I was drunk. So I would say, okay, let's do it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, But she and I were able to make amends, and now we're working on a friendship like we've never had in the 18 years that we were together, you know, and it's a wonderful thing. When my second wife left, she said, F you, and you'll never see the kids again. And she meant it. Like, I couldn't be with my children unsupervised for over a couple of hours, right? And she had it written in the court documents that I would have to take a picture every hour of a breathalyzer to prove that I was sober, right? Yeah. I remember when I was 30, the first time I was 30 days sober, uh, I met her in a parking lot um, for whatever reason. And we were talking, and I had the whole, I guess it was Pink Cloud or something. I know it was all ego, but I, it was probably cluttered with a bit of Pink Cloud, and I was trying to tell her about the program and you know, how things have changed. You know? And you got to think all the years and all the hell I put her through, 30 days sober, everything's better, right? Everything's good. It's all right. I'm fixed. Uh, she looked at me halfway through my spiel and said, shut the F up. I don't want to hear it. I don't care. Just give me my money and leave me alone. Okay. That didn't burst my bubble. That was five years ago. Um, I just had my children last night because her and her boyfriend wanted to go do something, but they couldn't because they had to go get the kids. Would I be willing to pick the kids up and keep them over the night and take them to school in the morning? What a wonderful gift, right? That's not me. That's this program. That's practicing the principles behind the 12 steps to the best of my ability. Me being honest, continuing to be honest, open, and willing the best that I can with each day that I'm given. You know, she and I have been able to have conversations where we have both cried and said that we will love each other simply for the fact that we have the children together, you know, and we work on a friendship today like we never had before. What a phenomenal thing, you know. I wouldn't have those things without this program. Right. I lost my career. I lost my family. Um, the only reason I didn't lose the house because it wasn't in my name, but I lost everything. Um, one thing that I don't like that people say, because I don't necessarily agree with it. Keep coming back. It'll get better. It doesn't always get better. Right. Because the wife didn't come back. Right. I didn't get the career back. Right. I lost the six figure check. Right? The cars went away. All that stuff went away. What I do like is that keep coming back, it will get different because different ultimately becomes better. I don't have that career, but I do have a relationship with both my ex-wives. Right? I don't have the three cars, but I do have my kids every weekend. You know, I don't have all those things, but I do have the ability to be in a room full of people and look you in the eye and feel completely comfortable and safe and at ease. Those are wonderful gifts to me. And that's a hell of a lot better than the way I've lived my life. You know, to live my life in fear, I no longer have to. Right? As long as I stay in the middle of the program as best I can. You know, I love the triangle and the three sides of it. Because for me, without the recovery, which is the foundation, I would not have the unity, which is the willingness to be around y'all and open up to be with y'all. 
and then in turn I wouldn't have the desire to be of service to anybody, right? So I truly love the triangle today, and I appreciate it. Um, traditions is what I'm still working on. I, my sponsor used to make me go to tradition meetings, and I used to only share my, my sponsors making me be here. I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> love and tolerance, and then I'd shut up. Um, I'm getting a deeper appreciation. For, oh, I should have told you my sobriety day at the end of the story, right? We're going to change the way we do things in AA. Yeah. Uh, my sobriety date is June 26, 2017. So, God willing, uh, June 26 this year will be three years. Um, but right now it's two years, and I'm good with that. Um, it's the longest I've been sober since I started to drink at 14. That's, and that's, and that's a crazy thing for me. Um, me and another guy up in Canton are going to be starting a primary purpose meeting. Uh, Sunday is going to be the first one. Uh, and working with trying to start this meeting, because there's not many out in Canton on Sunday, um, I've had, um, very close workings with the traditions, talking to the people of which we're going to be running from as to why these traditions work and how they're going to work for this group because singleness of purpose and no affiliation, right? We have to pay you something. You can't tell us what to do. This is our sole purpose, right, is to carry the message to the next suffering alcoholic, right? Um, no other reason whatsoever. So you, we're not going to do any of your stuff. What you know? Ultimately, I'm saying that for me, I'm getting a deeper appreciation for the 12 traditions. I sure as hell don't have a complete understanding of them, but I'm getting a deeper appreciation um, and understand that my sponsor says, these help me from killing myself. These help me from killing y'all, right? Okay. That works for me. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm about out of time. And I don't know. I don't know. If there is anybody that um, happens to be new or is struggling, uh, I pray that you can remember uh, that you are not alone and you are loved, that you don't have to do this alone. And we do this together as long as we remain honest, open, and willing, right? Honest with ourselves, open to the idea, and willing to give it a shot just for today. And everything will be okay, and it sure as hell will get different. That's all I got. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.